Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on the Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we are exploring the science of horticulture. Host Casey Hinches has the simple science of keeping plants healthy. Shelly Mitchell, OSU Associate Extension Specialist, uncovers backyard ecosystems and makes a game of learning about what parts of plants we eat. We also get the science of water transpiration in plants and symbiotic plant relationships. It's February and likely you or someone you know is coughing and sneezing. Hopefully that's the extent of your symptoms, but we are in the middle of the flu season. <laughs> Just like there are certain things that we do to prevent catching the flu, there's also certain things that you can do to prevent plant diseases from, from spreading in your garden. The first thing is to be knowledgeable about the diseases and also the symptoms so that you can correctly identify these as soon as possible. A great resource is to go to your local county extension office. You can simply take a part of the specimen or some photographs in for identification. If they are not able to help you with a confident identification of what might be wrong with your plant, they'll send these samples or the photographs off to the Plant Disease and Insect Diagnostic Laboratory here at OSU. Consider this like going to your general practitioner and them not being able to confidently identify what might be wrong with you and they send you to a specialist. However, we hope that it doesn't get to this point. And just like there's precautions that you can take for your own health safety, there's also precautions that you can take in the garden. <laughs> the first step is avoidance. Just like in the flu season, we avoid crowded, confined spaces so that we don't catch other people's germs. In the garden, we want to make sure that we space plants out and that we also don't put plants in a location where we know there's been disease problems prior. Another thing is that often diseases with plants happen at particular times or due to environmental conditions. You can prevent this by planting the plant earlier or later. Another thing to keep in mind is you want to make sure that you're going into your garden season with a clean bill of health. So any plants that you introduce into your garden, you want to make sure they're disease free. Just like when we have new babies, we often isolate them in order to make sure they're getting off to a strong start. Or maybe you have a friend that's had flu-like symptoms and we've often told those people to stay at home. We often do this with plants as well by quarantining them. We'll often take plants and set them aside in order to monitor any symptoms or to ensure that they don't develop any symptoms before we introduce them to the larger plant population. While it might seem that some people are just more prone to get sick, the same is true with plants. There are certain plants that more, are more susceptible to catching diseases. Now, some plants might also reflect that they have more resistance. Resistance is not the same thing as immunity. Therefore, you want to make sure to maintain the plant's overall health because if the health of the plant declines, so does the resistance, especially under stressful conditions. Just like the doctor says, stress affects your health as well. In the plant world, it's very hard to actually cure plant diseases. So really, we're looking at preventing the spread of those diseases onto healthy plants. We often look at the environmental conditions that might make certain plants more susceptible to certain diseases during that time. At that time, that's often when we start applying fungicides and bactericides in order to protect healthy plants. We also might use physical barriers, such as cloth, to drape over plants in order to prevent insects that often carry these diseases from getting to our plants. This is like, as people, we often use hand sanitizers and facial masks to prevent the spread of germs. 
While all of this might seem overwhelming as we're in the midst of flu season, as we enter our gardening season, we want to make sure to keep all of this information in mind. It's important to be knowledgeable about the plant diseases and their symptoms. Therefore, you can have early detection and quick response to reduce the impact on your plants and your garden. If you want to take a field trip that's really local and explore lots of neat animal habitats and ecosystems, you don't have to go any further than your backyard. Just in a regular backyard, there's plenty of places for animals to hide, find food, find water, and so we're going to explore some of those today. So we just happen to be sitting in an old wood pile, and those are common in parks and at the edges of properties. And so what's under wood? Well, if you've ever picked up a piece of wood outside, you notice that it's wet under there. And so some things like the wet, like roly polies, worms, stuff like that. So a good place to find easy wildlife is just right under a log. So I have a log here and I'm pretty sure that if I pick it up, there's gonna be something. Not sure what, but we'll find out. So under this one, wow, we got a whole horde of worms there and some little roly polies. Now the roly polies are always under the logs because they're actually crustaceans. They have to actually breathe through gills. So they need a wet area so they can actually breathe. This is a best beetle. They live in wood that's not freshly cut down but is a couple of years dead basically. And they like to eat the dead rotting wood and that's what they feed their babies. And they actually survive as family units. These aren't little guys that live on their own. They actually take care of their babies. So they live in family groups. And here's the kind of stuff they do to the wood. You see all these big holes, like right here. That's what they do. They eat out the soft parts of the wood. So they'll be there for a while until all the soft parts are gone. And then they'll move on to another somewhat recently dead tree. Here we have more of the family of best bugs. And then look at all these little termite guys. You can tell they're termites because they don't have a waste like an ant does. And they eat a bunch of dead logs and all that. But they have a job. They're not just there to ruin your house. They're there to help clean up and help things decompose. Because if we didn't have decomposers and stuff that likes to eat dead and rotting things, we'd be up to our waist and leaves and dead twigs and stuff. So they have a purpose in the ecosystem. All right, another really neat thing about fallen logs is that sometimes they have a hollow in them. And so that would be a nice little place if you were trying to raise a family or if you were wanting to get out of the weather or if you were hiding from a predator, you could go hide inside a hollow log. Or if you're really small, like a baby rabbit, you don't even have to have a big log to hide in. I've seen them coming out of this grass. So sometimes in here there will be a baby rabbit and, or even a big rabbit and you'll see them dart out. So that's a good place to hide away from the eyes of hawks and stuff like that. So there we have it. Even in your own backyard, there's plenty to see in terms of habitats for wild animals. You've got shrubs for birds. You've got big grasses for small mammals. You've got decaying wood for the decomposers. You even have a place where a fox could curl up and wait out a rainstorm. Hi, today we're going to talk about the six parts of a plant. The main parts of a plant are the roots, the stem, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and the seeds. So we're actually going to sing a song after we learn about all the different plant parts and what they do. So everybody stand up right now, wherever you are, and we're gonna demonstrate the six parts of a plant on your body. So at the bottom, where your feet are, those would be the roots. And the purpose of the roots is to anchor the plant in the soil, and that's also where the water comes in the plant. So when we say roots, we're gonna to touch our toes. Next part of the plant is the stem. Okay, so this is the stem. And the purpose of the stem, it helps the plant stand straight up. And it also has water going through the plant. And then all the sugar that's made during the photosynthesis that the plant uses is all going through the stem. All right, leaves. Leaves are important because they perform photosynthesis. 
And all that means is they're taking sunlight and they're turning it into sugars and that's what helps the plant grow. That's how they make their own food. All right. Sometimes when it's time to reproduce, some plants make flowers. All right. And flowers get pollinated and they make seeds. All right. And they turn into a fruit. So we had the flowers that turn into a fruit with the seeds inside. So to represent fruit, we act like we just harvested a bunch of apples and we're carrying them in our shirts. That's fruit. And then the seeds inside the fruit. All right, so is everybody ready? We're gonna sing a song about the six parts of the plants. And it's to the tune of the Adams Family or the Days of the Week song, depending on what age you are. All right, so here it goes. Da na na na, da na na na. Da na na na, da na na na, da na na na. There's roots and stems and leaves, flowers, fruit, and seeds. You roll them all together, you got the parts of the plant. Parts of the plant. Parts of the plant, parts of the plant, parts of the plant. Now that we've talked about the six parts of the plant, we're going to talk about some of the food we eat and determine what part of the plant it comes from. All right, so remember the six parts of the plant are the roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, and the seeds. So we're going to give you guys a quiz and see if you can figure it out. All right, peppers. Now peppers don't taste sweet, but they have seeds inside. And if it has seeds inside, it's a fruit. All right, if you eat salads, usually there's some kind of lettuce or spinach as the base, and those are actually leaves that we're eating. All right, this one kind of gives it away. Cauliflower, we're actually eating the flower, all right? If you have broccoli or cauliflower and you let it get old, all these little buds will actually open up and be flowers. So when you're eating cauliflower, you're actually eating little flowers. All right, asparagus. When we eat asparagus, what do you think we're eating? We're eating the stems. Here's some celery, it's already been cut, but this is also a stem. All right, broccoli, just like cauliflower, all those little green parts on top that look like little buds, those actually are flower buds, and they will actually open into flowers. All right, a carrot. Carrots come out of the ground. You don't see them until you harvest them. Those are actually roots. Radish, same thing. It only takes like a month to grow a radish, but they are roots. All right, corn's actually kind of a tricky one, all right? All these little kernels, those are all seeds. So when you eat corn, you're actually eating seeds. All right, bok choy, what do you think those are? Those are leaves. Oh, here's a good one for the summertime, watermelon, all right? Now there's seeds inside, so that tells us that it's a fruit. It also happens to be sweet, which is what most people associate with fruit. All right, this one's not so sweet, but it is also a fruit, the pumpkin. All those pumpkin seeds inside tell you that the pumpkin is a fruit. And then wheat, all right? All these little guys are seeds that we mash up to make flour and into pancakes and stuff like that. So those are the seeds. So those are the six parts of the plant we eat. Now I brought some examples so we can see if you guys can figure out some other examples. All right. These are cinnamon sticks. And if you look at the ends, they're kind of curled up because what this actually is, is tree bark that they take off the cinnamon tree. And once they take it off, it curls up into these little sticks, and that's what we use to season our food with. So since these are bark, cinnamon's actually from the stem of the cinnamon tree. You don't see too many of these in Oklahoma, but this 
is from a coconut tree, all right, a coconut palm. This is a coconut that is still in the husk. So this is not what you normally find at the stores. Normally they take this husk off, all right, because it's really hard to get off if you're not used to doing it. So I brought another coconut that I actually sawed in half and it's all dried up and old, but the milk would be in here. And this is the meat of the coconut, which you can shred and eat. And this outline right here is what you're used to seeing for a coconut. That is the seed of this. So this is the fruit of the coconut. And what we actually eat is basically shredded seed. That's a really big seed. This is also something you don't find in Oklahoma. This only grows within about 15 degrees of the equator. That is the cacao pod. That is where we get chocolate from. Inside the cacao pod are the beans. Now when they're first harvested, they're in a really milky substance. So they spread it all out and let the beans dry. Then they take those beans and ship them to like Hershey, Pennsylvania, where they're made into chocolate. So chocolate basically is a seed from a fruit. A lot of the herbs we eat, we're eating the leaves. So this is oregano. And you just take off the leaves as you need them to season food. You can just have it growing on your windowsill and harvest it when you want. You don't have to buy the dried version. And now that you know what all the foods you eat, what part of the plant they're from, you can now say you literally know where your food comes from. Most scientists agree that water is the key to life, and where you find water, you might also find life. And because plants are living things, water is also critical to the development and growth of plants. One reason is for the transpiration stream. That's right. Did you know there is a stream of water running through plants? No, not a traditional stream with rocks and fish, a transpiration stream. But before we jump into that transpiration stream, we need to talk about a few properties of water. Water is both cohesive and adhesive. Cohesive means that it likes to stick to itself. An example of this is when you see water out on leaves of plants. If those water droplets come together, they stay together. That's an example of cohesive. Adhesive means it will stick to something else, sort of like adhesive tape. An example of water being an adhesive is after a heavy rain or the morning dew, you'll often see water particles hanging or clinging to the tips of the leaves. The other thing to know about water is it is known as the universal solvent. A solvent is something that can dissolve other substances. Water is known as the universal solvent because it dissolves more substances than any other liquid. The majority of a plant's water is absorbed through its roots. And because we know water is a universal solvent, any of those nutrients, and including fertilizer, that might be in the soil get dissolved in that water, and that's how it's taken up through the plant. But what causes the water to be drawn up into the plant? For that, we need to talk about capillary action. Have you ever put a paper towel in some water and watched that water climb up the paper towel? This is capillary action. What is a capillary? A capillary is a small tube, and in plants, that small tube is called the xylem. And that's how the water travels from the roots of the plants all the way to the top of the plants. But capillary action will only work so far until it can't overcome the force of gravity. But we know there's some really tall trees, some that are over 300 feet. So how does water get from the bottom of that plant all the way up 300 feet? For that, we need to talk about humidity. The inside of plants has 100% humidity. The outside of plants, unless it's raining, does not have 100% humidity. That moisture is trying to find an equilibrium and will lose moisture out of its leaves through pores called stomata. This evaporation process is called transpiration. On rainy days, the plant doesn't transpire as much because of the humidity outside of the plant. On hot, sunny, dry days, the plant transpires a lot. As that 
water transpires out of the leaf, it pulls more and more molecules up from the base of that plant. And that's called the transpiration stream. This uninterrupted stream of water molecules moving through the plants is called the transpiration stream. And the cool thing is this is happening in all the plants all around us. The rate at which that stream is traveling depends on how hot or humid the day is outside of that plant. On hot sunny days like today, that water is evaporating or transpiring out of that plant quickly, which means it needs more moisture around its roots to draw up through the plant. On humid rainy days, it's not transpiring as much, so the stream is moving slower, therefore it doesn't need as much water at the base of that plant. That's why you have to water your plants more often on hot summer days. Don't believe me? Try this easy fun experiment at home. Get a glass of water, just plain tap water, and add some food coloring. Red color often works the best. Mix that up so that it has a nice solution there. Again, water is a universal solvent, so it dissolves that dye. Then get you some celery. If you can find some celery that have some leaves on it, that would be the best. Cut a fresh cut at the base of that celery so that it's ready to absorb moisture. If your celery is slightly wilted, that's okay. It just means it's thirsty. Place your freshly cut celery into the dyed water. Let it set for a few days and you'll notice that the red dye will slowly transpire up to the tips of the leaves as the water evaporates out of the plant. The reason why this experiment works so well is because celery is actually a plant stem. You can see here we've had this one set overnight and the red water was pulled up through the celery and now has dyed our leaves as the water has transpired out of the plant. You want to make sure that you have plenty of water so that there's enough to completely fill that plant as it's drawing up that water. If you have a celery stalk that doesn't have leaves, you can still see this here. We can see those red dots are the xylem where the water is taken up through the plant and you can see the red dye has come out the top as the water has exited. Now we did another little example by putting a celery stalk in upside down just to see if it would work. You can see here the red dye was taken up a little bit through capillary action but because the plant doesn't transpire out of the base of the plant, it did not draw the red dye up throughout the plant. So without adhesion, cohesion, and the universal solvent water, we wouldn't have the transpiration streams that are flowing through all of the plants around us. And that's what makes water the key to life. Organisms do not live in isolation from each other. We're always interacting. So whether it's human and plant or human and animal, animal and animal, plant and plant, there's always interactions. And sometimes those interactions actually play a role in the lives of the organisms. Sometimes the interactions are positive for both species. Sometimes they're negative for both species. And sometimes one gets something out of the... Uh, relationship and one doesn't. So the first one we're going to talk about is mutualism. In mutualism both species benefit from a relationship. So in the case of pollinators and flowers, the pollinators get nectar out of the deal and the uh, flowers get pollinated. After flowers get pollinated they, they get fertilized and so then the seeds can develop and reproduce, allow the flower to reproduce with seeds. So that's one example of mutualism. Another example of mutualism is plants that actually depend on each other to survive. In this case, it's actually obligatory mutualism because these are lichens. They're composed of a fungus and an algae, and they cannot live apart. When they are in a lichen situation, they are actually depending on each other to survive. So there's different kinds of lichens, as you can see. There's orange ones, and there's crusty ones, and gray ones and all kinds of colors. You'll see these on headstones, you'll see these on fence posts, you'll see these on living trees. And what they're doing is 
the lichen and the, the fungus and the um, algae are helping each other to survive. So fungus cannot photosynthesize, so they can't make their own food. They have to digest things outside their body and then absorb the nutrients. But algae can make its own food because it photosynthesizes. But algae needs a wetter place to live. And so the fungus can absorb water and they can absorb nutrients and then they can give that to the, to the algae and the algae photosynthesizes and gives its sugars to the fungus. So they work together to have a little place to live. Next week, we'll be knee-deep in ornamental grasses. Casey will look at some great annual and native grasses for the landscape, as well as some great not-grass grasses. Until then, we wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.